right, we are. Last week we started with a series called The Battle of Your Mind, and today we're continuing with that basic theory or series is the fact that we are in a spiritual battle, and it's not just ourselves, it's not just the world that we see, but we are in a spiritual battle. Until we understand that, we will be wasting a lot of our energy, a lot of our time, and boxing the air instead of dealing with the real issues that are there. And so we're talking about the devil knocks. Oh, come on. You really believe there's a devil? Yes. <laughs> we'll explain in a few moments, okay, about the devil and who the devil is and who the devil is not. And we're talking about the ac accusations. He's called the accuser of the brethren. And we are in a battle. And last week we spoke about that the battle primarily, the battlefield is in the mind. That's where it takes place right between your ears. And last week we talked about how important it is to think the right thoughts and to take stock of what you think about. So when the devil knocks, what happens? He will knock on your door. He'll try to get you to believe a lie. You see, the enemy is not as powerful as God. People often think that, well, first of all, people don't even believe there is a devil in many people. So let's just go ahead and take a look at it. This is our basic theme verses is this. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. I love it says that. It doesn't say be strong and, and, and face it. No, it says be strong in what? The Lord, not in yourself. See, the problem often when you and I get into is we think we just got to get this information in us about how to fight the, the, the enemy. Then we just got to go out and do it ourselves. No, that's not the way it is. This is different. God does not send us out by ourselves. And I'll tell you right now, it might shock you if you haven't heard it before, but we don't want you living for the Lord in this church. At Cornerstone, please don't live for the Lord. Live with the Lord. The Bible says, I can do all things, not for Christ, but with Christ. You see, God has called us to live with Him, to walk through life with Him. Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father, present tense, doing, not what He did. You see, everything Jesus did, He did in relationship with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. My friends, you and I need to do the same. And so the problem is religion is about systems and theories and trying hard on ourselves while Christianity and following Christ is walking with Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit through our lives. And that is the key difference, everybody. So it says here, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on God's armor so that you'll be able to stand against the strategies of the devil. Yes, there is a strategy of the devil. His primary strategy, by the way, is to get you to believe in lies. If he can get you to... See, the, the, the enemy, the devil, is a defeated foe. He's not as strong as God. So let's just go ahead and look at a couple more scriptures here. It says this, For we're not fighting against flesh and blood, enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities, which talks about there's a whole legion of demons, which we'll get into in a few moments, of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So there is an unseen realm you and I are not aware of. And if something is going on in the unseen realm. So the devil is real. He's not a mythological creature. He's not some jumpsuit, pitchfork, something you hear. No, the devil is real, okay? He is a created being, all right? He originally was an archangel, and we know about three archangels in the Scripture. One is Michael, one is Gabriel, and one is Lucifer. And Lucifer is, was, was the son of the morning star, and he decided to rebel against God, and he took a third of the angels with him. And so what we have right now is a third of the angels called demons that are out to do his bidding. Now, let me say something very, very important. The devil is not omnipresent. Omnipresent is a fancy theological term which simply means he's not at all places at all times. He can only be at one place at one time. He's not omnipresent. God is omnipresent. But the devil has his strategies. He has his demons. He has different legions of demons that are out there that her, their whole job is to kill, destroy, and lie. So he originally was an archangel, and he fell. All right? Now, he's also called the father of lies. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the what? Truth, 
I am the light. So God is truth, the enemy is lies. He functions and he lives in lies. And if he can get us to believe a lie, then he can get control over us by us giving up by believing a lie. And this is what he does. So many times he'll say, you blew it. You're no good. What you did, you never match up. You're, what you did in your past is not good enough. God cannot use you. He's also called the accuser. And an accuser is out there to find faults in you and to expose them and point at you. He does, he does a tremendous thing to the devil. You know what he does? He, he will tempt you. Hey, it's okay. Everyone's doing it. Go ahead and click on that image. It's okay. Hey, it's okay to hang out with your girlfriend or boyfriend and do these things. It's okay. Listen, God understands you're just human. And as soon as you fall, ah, you jerk. What kind of Christian are you? You're going to go to hell. Right? So what he'll do is he'll tempt you to do something and tell you it's no big deal. Then once you do it, you've committed the unpardonable sin and you might as well give up. In fact, it's happened to me. Not too long ago, I, uh, this is a while ago, by the way. This is probably, goodness gracious, it's too many vans ago. <laughs> too many vans ago, which is like 10 years ago. We were driving with my family. And um, I don't know if you're aware of the fact, but have you noticed how women control everything? Right? They do. I mean, Siri tells me what to do. My wife tells me what to do. GPS tells me what to do. And, and it's okay. And my mother tells me. Everyone tells me what to do. And one time I was driving, and I, I don't know how you guys are, but sometimes when I drive, I find it's an area that I need a little help with with the Lord. Uh, because I like to blame other people for missing a turn. So uh, Sandra and I, we were trying to get some place, and I was getting lost and making mistakes. And I don't know what came over me, but I just kind of lost it. I, I just lost it. And I acted like a jerk. I did. I acted like a jerk. I'm not proud of the fact. I got so agitated and so upset, I stopped the van, put the hazards on, pulled over. I got out of the van, and I walked home. It took me three hours. <laughs> and I had blisters on my feet. And that's why I'm having a hard time walking this morning. <laughs> just, well, let me just say what happened a number of years ago, over 10 years ago that happened, right? And I acted like an idiot because I was upset. I let the, uh, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, I walk home and I pray about it. And I, I hear the enemy saying, and you're the pastor of the church? Really? And you're going to preach tomorrow? Really? What kind of example? What kind of father are you? What's wrong with you? You don't deserve to be up there. And I started feeling all these condemning thoughts. Meanwhile, he says, you need to show that you're the man. Now, it's a good thing I got up and left the car. Because if I didn't leave the car, I don't know what would have happened. So I was smart enough to get out of that situation. But sometimes we make mistakes. And so I had this condemning thought on me saying, you're no good. You're a hypocrite. And so what I did, of course, and the next day was Sunday. Now, how many of you have noticed this happens? You're coming to church. You're planning to go to church. The night before you go to church, you have a, the biggest argument you've ever had with your parents. Or you had your biggest argument you've ever had with your spouse. Or let's say you went out and you drank and you got drunk. And now the next morning comes and you're like, I, should go to, I can't go to church. I'm a hypocrite. I can't do that. That's wrong. I can't do that. And so you start feeling condemned. And you feel like, I'm not worthy enough. Or maybe you get in a car. This happened to me when I was, when I was growing up. And, and it, believe me, the, the enemy is out there to try to get us not to be in God's house and to be encouraged together. My dad was a pastor, still is a pastor. We're driving to church. I'm like six years old. And we're going to church. And we're making my father late. And so he's in the car. We're in a 1974 Grand Torino mint green station wagon with dark hunter green leather seats that's not, not leather vinyl seats that sweat and we're going to church and we're making my dad late the whole car is in an uproar we're arguing ah we're yelling we get to the church we pull in we pull out everyone goes hi pastor dad good to see you we're all smiling we're all happy except for me my hair is sticking up my mother goes and like that i mean it was a bad morning but how many times have we done that? I, I know some of you may be in the way to church this morning. Maybe you had the biggest argument you ever had. It's not an accident, everybody. And so I, I'm not suggesting we let things go. No. But what happens is you and I are going to make mistakes, whether we like it or not. It doesn't give us a license. It doesn't mean you do whatever you want to do. But the truth is you and I are full of sin. 
And until we get to heaven, you and I have a sin problem we have to deal with. And the accuser would come and say, he'll try to define you by your sin and what you've done. And, try, and he'll tempt you to do something. He'll tempt you to look at something. He'll tempt you to flirt with somebody. He'll tempt you to do all sorts of things you shouldn't be doing. And then once you do it, he'll say, what a jerk you are. First he says, it's no big deal. And then when you do it, it's a big deal. He's fantastic at it. We are in a battle. He's called the accuser of the brethren. If he can get you accused, then he has power. He's also called the destroyer. And let me say something very important, as I mentioned just earlier, that God is stronger than the enemy. There's no contest. You know what Jesus said to his disciples? They came back after having a tremendous ministry experience. Demons were cast out of people. People were getting healed. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. In other words, when Satan rebelled, God's like, out, bam, he came down like that. Wasn't even a contest. And you're like, okay, if that be the case, then why is there so much evil in the world? Because he gave them unlimited a time. But the decisive battle was won on the cross through Jesus Christ. That was the end of the war. But battles still go on. The decisive battle during World War II was D-Day. It took six to eight months until the whole war was over. The enemy was sniping. The enemy was trying to stop. How many of you have ever seen a light bulb? Just before it burns out, it gets brighter. Have you ever seen that happen? Oh, like a, um, a, one of the old-fashioned non-LED lights. It gets real bright. Shh, boom, and it goes out. And that's what the enemy's doing. He knows his time is short. Like a, like a cornered rat, he begins to do more damage as his time is short. But his time is short. The decisive victory was on the cross. We're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. The, the basic war is over, but we're still in the mopping up operations of the final conclusion of all history. In fact, the Bible says, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I am with you until the end of the age. And he says, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And I heard a woman that refused to get on an airplane. And they said, why won't you go on the airplane? Because the Bible says, lo, I'm with you always. Therefore, I cannot go on an airplane. The first servers laughed. Thank you. God is stronger. There's no contest at all. You see, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. There's a big difference, everybody. We're on the winning team. It's not like the Yankees playing the Red Sox. God help the Yankees. They, Baltimore Orioles wiped them out, and now Boston... Okay, I'm going to get started here. And Chris, if you're watching at home, McMahon, we're going to beat you today. We're not fighting for victory, but from victory. For Jesus Christ has already defeated Satan. He's already done it, everybody. But then you're saying, okay, really? Then if, he's, if we are victorious, then why am I struggling so much? Because we're in the tension of the kingdom of God is here. In part... It will be finalized when Christ comes back. You see, it says in Colossians 1, 13 to 14, For he, that's Jesus, has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Christ is bigger than anything else we face. He says, the Bible says also, For he who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. So you have to understand that. If you don't believe it, first of all, if the enemy can get you to believe it doesn't exist, then he's got victory. All right, this is what he does. In fact, I like what C.S. Lewis says, one of my favorite authors of all times, is this. There's two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. Or the other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So this is what the enemy tries to do. He either tries to get, you know, doesn't exist, or we're preoccupied with them. Where everything's the devil. Well, when you pray, you mention the devil's name more than you mention Jesus' name. Oh, the devil this, oh, the devil that. And we could bind Satan, we bind. I mean, I don't like prayer rings like that where the whole time we're binding Satan. It's like we're praying to Satan. And I've known people that just blame the devil for everything. And they blame God for everything. They take no personal responsibility. In fact, I heard a story that the devil one day 
was sulking on the corner, sitting on a curb with his hands in his face, crying. And God comes up to him and says, what's the problem, Lucifer? He said, they blame me for everything. And God goes, welcome to the club. I mean, people blame the devil. And people blame God. The truth is, you and I have a, not, a lot more responsibility than we give ourselves. You see, the way the enemy gets in victory is getting us to believe a lie. We believe a lie, he's got us. That's why you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the life. So if the truth sets you free, a lie will hold you in bondage, and he's called the father of lies. There's no truth in him at all. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul says this. Though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. Okay? For the weapons of our warfare, as we mentioned last week, are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We can tear down strongholds with the truth of who God is. We destroy how? Arguments. You see, the battle's here, everybody. The battle's in your mind. That's why it's extremely important what you think. What you think, we mentioned last week, what you think in your mind gets down to your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind does not know the difference between a lie or truth. And if you're not careful, it can begin to pollute you. So you must know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we have to what? Destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. There's a lot of lofty opinions against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive and make it obey Christ. You see, the Word of God is true, and God is true. It says in 1 Peter 5, 8, talks about the devil. There is a devil out there, everybody. He's, he's not, it's not the yin and the yang, okay? We don't have the dark side and the good side of the force. We don't have the George Lucas theology, which is fine for science fiction and entertainment, or Eastern mysticism or Eastern religions, where you have the yin and the yang. you got to balance. No. In God, there's no darkness at all. Stay alert. Watch out for your enemy, the devil. He prowls around like, not a house cat, but a lion, looking for someone to devour. I used to have a house cat at one time, and they used to feel like this. I used to pray. I guess that's why my, my dad had a cat, because a cat prays. But, um, thank you. That was, that was like, yeah, thank you. Uh, but I, I like to watch, once in a while, I like to watch Animal Planet or whatever these things on television. And I remember seeing the Serengeti in Africa, and I remember seeing this whole pack of zebras going across. And you could see that the, the, the lions try to go after them. And what would happen is that the zebras would all get together, and they'd kick with their back legs and kick away the lions. They couldn't get them. The only way the lions had success is when they prayed. They must be Christian. But they pray, and they wait until one of the zebras leaves the pack and just kind of, kind of goes a little behind. It prays, waits for a weak point, and then pounces on that zebra and takes it out. My friends, that's what the enemy does. This is why we encourage you. You're not called to live this Christian life by yourself. If you're running across the Serengeti of this life, not in a pack of other believers, you are prey to be taken out by the enemy. And all through the Bible, it always says we, us. They sent the disciples out two by two. I know in the summertime, it's easy to get, oh, I don't have to go today. Oh, I'm going to go to the beach. And the next thing you know, you get out of habit. The Bible says in, in, in Hebrews, do not, do not neglect the fellowship of others. You're probably saying, why are you telling me this? I'm at church today. I understand. <laughs> but do not neglect the fellowship of others, right? lest you fall away. So it's important to stay in a pack of believers. We're not called to fight this by ourselves. It's just not you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus and His body. That's why we want to encourage you to get involved with small groups. Not because of small groups or anything. It's because other believers, you work together and you can fight and you can watch out for each other, okay? Because the devil is out there and he's trying to prey upon us. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians talks about a, there's a lot of sin in the church. They were correcting a man that did tremendous sin. And while they're correcting him, he was given instruction. Hey, guys, you need to correct him, but you need to restore him as well. This is what he says. But the one whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. He goes on. So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. 
for we're not ignorant of his schemes. So there was a person in the church that did something wrong. They had to punish him. Almost like a child. You have to punish a child. But you got to be careful how you punish. You don't want to break the person so bad that they never get back to restoration. They lose hope. He says this. We're not ignorant of his schemes. What's the scheme of the devil? What's one of the schemes? Well, he's called the accuser of the brethren. The book of Revelation says, For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who what? Accuses them day and night before our God. The accuser of our brother is out there all the time trying to accuse you of doing something wrong. And he likes the nighttime. I don't know if some of you have this, have this um, delightful um, advantage of getting up several times during the night to use the facilities. And as you do that, you go back to, the, uh, the, back to their bed. And all of a sudden, the enemy's like, hey, what about this? You did this wrong. You did this wrong. It's not going to work out. And you hear the accusations happening. He, he, day and night, he, ac he, he accuses us. You know, I want you to picture with me what we're talking about here. He's an accuser. If, if you could please imagine with me a, uh, a court of law, and there's a big bench here, and the judge is God. And you're sitting there, and you're guilty. And you have, uh, you have the prosecuting attorney is coming after you. And he, he's got a list of all the stuff you've done wrong. And he sits there accusing you, accusing you, accusing you, accusing you, accusing you. Why? He, he knows his power the, the prosecuting attorney's power is limited by the law. Satan is limited by God's law. In Job 1.6, he goes up to heaven and tries to get permission. He can't get permission unless God gives him permission or we give him permission. So we give a lot more power to the enemy we should. But he accuses them day and night before God. And so now we look at Zechariah, and Zechariah is a prophetic picture. Pro pro prophetic means um, a view from God of how something is. This is an analogy uh, of explaining what happens in the heavenlies. All right? So I want to encourage you to understand it in that way. So we're looking at a court of law. We have the bench. We have the God who's the judge. And we have the prosecuting attorney, the enemy, whose desire is to prosecute you, to show your faults, and to go before God and say, ha-ha, I have a right to meddle in this person's life. If you remember, it says in Ephesians, uh, in the book of Ephesians, it says, be angry and do not sin, lest you give the devil a what? Foothold. What's a foothold? A, an, an avenue to go before the judge. Hey, judge, uh, Eric has unforgiveness towards his, uh, towards his brother. And uh, so I have a right to interfere with his life. And he, and he goes, you do. That's why forgiveness is so important. Remember the story Jesus told about? I don't know if you remember the story. Talked about a man that would not forgive another man. One I'm not going to give the whole uh, synopsis of the whole thing, but let me just quickly say He said, if you don't forgive your brother, God won't forgive you. He says, hand him over to the torturers until he pays every last cent. So will my father do to you if you don't forgive. Why? Because the enemy will come and say, I want jurisdiction. God said, you can't touch him. Da, 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 okay? Can't touch him. The only way you can touch him, by the way, that, he's, a, he's actually a pastor now, MC Hammer. Anyhow. He can't touch it. So he comes with a, he comes to the quarter, hey, I have, a, I, have a, I have a warrant to mess in his life. He has not forgiven his brother. And God will go, okay, you have a right in this area. That's what happens. He is a defeated foe. He doesn't have power unless we give it to him, everybody. I hope you see what I'm trying to say. Because it's true. So, the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, the accuser, Satan. Say, he's to call the accuser. That's his job. He's a prosecuting attorney. Was there at the angel's right hand making accusations, plural, against Joshua. And Joshua represents Israel. He represents us. The Bible says you are a kingdom of priests, right? You and I are like priests. When Christ died on the cross, the old ways of doing things are, are broken. No longer do you need a priest to go before God. Now the Bible says you are a kingdom of priests. So what happens is, the enemy would sit there and accuse you and accuse me. Hey, do you know what he did the other day? Hey, the thoughts you have right there, you're full of sin. And he'll try to accuse you before God. And if we're not careful and we allow the accusations to happen, 
then we can get foiled by him and lose the freedom. We have to realize that we don't have what it takes, but God does through Jesus Christ. So the accuser was there at the angel's right hand making accusations against Joshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations. Again, he says, I, the Lord, reject. Why? Ye yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, the Lord who has chosen you and me for giving your life to Christ, rebukes you. This man is a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Listen, guys, all of us. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But Jesus Christ saves us from all of our sins if we accept him. All of us have gone astray, right? And Christ has pulled us out. He's redeemed us, not ourselves. He's, we've accepted what he's given us. And so this man was like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire. Joshua's clothing was filthy. The Bible says your righteousness is like filthy menstrual cloths. That's what it literally means. I know that's gross, but the Bible is gross sometimes. It says that our righteousness is like filthy clothes. You and I don't have what it takes to get rid of the filth. So all of us are standing with filthy garments on. As he stood before the angel. And so the angel said to the others standing there, take off his filthy clothes. I love it. If you give your life to Jesus Christ and you say, God, forgive me of my sins, God will take off the filthy clothes off of you. And turn to Joshua, he said, see, I've taken away your sins. It doesn't say he took away his sins, Joshua. But God took Joshua's sins away and God will take your sins away. But you have to say, take it off. There are times that sometimes I, I, I had this, um, I had this like swimwear. It's, it's kind of like a superhero. It's, it's, it's uh, it blocked me from the sun. It gets wet. I can't get it off. So I have to say, Sandra, please take it off. I have to go like this. And she literally has to pull it off of me because I'm getting so old I can't do it anymore. But she has to pull it off of me. And that's what God does. We surrender and he'll pull off those filthy garments, right? I have taken away your sins and now I am giving you these new clothes. God wants to clothe us with his beautiful garments. You know, it reminds me of the story that I think Jesus alludes to this in his parable of the prodigal son. You may remember the story. He had two sons. One, the younger son said, I want you dead, God. I want you dead, Dad. I just want your money. So he takes, his, he takes the inheritance, goes out, spends it on prostitutes and all that kind of stuff. He comes to the end of his money. He is now in a pigsty. He's filthy. He's dirty. He comes to himself and says, listen, my father has servants, and they're treated better than this. I'll go, this is what I'll do. I'll go back and say, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Let me be one of your hired servants. In other words, I, I've blown it so bad that even if God accepts me back, I'm going to have to live under the staircase. I, I'm not good enough to be a son anymore. I'm not good enough to be a daughter anymore. And, and Jesus tells a parable to talk about how God is. And the father's looking through the horizon every day, looking, looking for a little figure to, is that my son? Is that my son? That is lost. And then the, and he sees the prodigal son afar off. The Bible says the father ran to him and embraced him in all his filth. God wants to embrace you and I in all of our filth, if we're willing. He says, take off his filthy garment. Give him a festive robe, which means authority. Give him sandals. He's no longer a slave. He's a son. And give him my authority as a ring. That's what he gives him on him. Well, this is what God is saying here. Take off the filthy clothes. And turn to Joshua and said, I have taken away your sins. And now I'm giving you these new fine clothes. Then I said, they should also place a clean turban on his head. You know what the priests used to have in the priestly garments? They'd have a, they'd have a turban on their head and they had a, a medallion that would say, holy unto the Lord upon its mind. God wants your thought life to be holy. We have to take off the filthy head garment and put on the clean head garment. So they put a clean priestly turban on his head and dressed him in new clothes while the angel Lord stood by. This is what God has done for us if you've given your life to Christ. He'll take away your filthy clothes and he'll give you new clothes. Now listen, you and I both know that even though I have clean clothes, I like to play in the mud. And so do you. Right? We don't want to, but we, we constantly have to get ourselves cleansed before the Lord. 
and he will cleanse us if we will come to him and allow him. Now look what happens next. Then the angel of the Lord spoke very solemnly, and he speaks to us as well, and said, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army say. If you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you will be given authority over my temple. Now, the Bible says, this is the Old Testament, New Testament, you are the what of the Holy Spirit? You are the temple. How many of you struggle with authority over yourself? We all do, right? God wants to give you grace to have authority over your temple. No longer does your body tell you what to do. You tell your body what to do. Right? We're not going to be carnal minded anymore. So if you follow my ways and carefully serve me, then you'll be given authority over your temple. If you serve God and work with God, He will give you power over your temple. I don't know about you, but I want more authority with God in me in my temple. Right? Then you'll be given authority over my temple and the courtyards. I will let you walk among these others standing here. But, he says, this is what the head, he says, if you follow my ways. So we have a responsibility to take off our old clothes, allow God to clothe us new, and we need to listen and follow him. This is what God would have for us, everybody. That we can walk in the fullness of him. See, this is what happens. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. This is what the enemy would do. He'll get you to sin. He'll remind you something you did in your past. When you were 15 years old, you participated in an abortion, or you were divorced, or you cheated on your spouse, or you took the drugs, or you were involved with a, with a, uh, with a promiscuous relationship or something like that. And he'll remind you of that. He'll tell you of that. And he'll say, you can never be a full son or daughter. You're just going to have to barely make it. And God says, no, you're my son. You're my daughter. I want to give you clean clothes, right? And he would try to do what? He would try to give you godly, not godly sorrow, but worldly sorrow. So our culture today does not want godly sorrow. Our culture said it doesn't make a difference what you do, as long as you follow your own heart. And that's not true, everybody. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. So when you feel godly sorrow, godly sorrow will want you to go back to God. Let me give you an, a vivid example of what I'm talking about. If you're not familiar with the story, I'll give you the story. Jesus, uh, towards the last part of his life on earth, he was betrayed by two people. Two out of the 12 of his disciples betrayed him. You might have heard of him. His name is Judas. Judas Iscariot, who was the treasurer. He actually sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And what he did is he told the priest where Jesus was. And they arrested him. And they ended up crucifying Jesus. Another person that also betrayed Christ was Peter. In fact, he said it three times. He even swore, I do not know who this man is. Once Judas, we don't know why Judas did it. I, we believe, some of the scholars believe he did it because he wanted Jesus to kind of stand up to the Romans and stand up to the, and, and start doing something. He tried to force his will, what we thought God should do, which becomes satanic, by the way. When you try to force your will above God's will, that's satanic. And that's what began to happen to him. And so what happened was, all of a sudden, instead of godly sorrow, he had worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is, you've blown it. You're no good. You've messed it. So the enemy will tell you, go and do this. Go ahead and do it. It'll be fine. It's no big deal. The time you do it, you are scum. You deserve death. You're not good enough to be married to him or her. You're not good enough to ever get married. You're not good enough to ever be accepted by God. What you've done is beyond that. And he'll tell you that. And if you listen to that worldly sorrow, you know what begins to happen? It leads to death. Worldly sorrow produces death. So you have Judas who allowed the worldly sorrow to bring him death. But the godly sorrow of Peter brought him back to repentance. Where Jesus restored him. And the first person to give a sermon on the day of Pentecost was Peter. And 3,000 gave their life to Jesus Christ. What sorrow do you have? How do you know the difference? Very simple. Very simple. Godly sorrow leads you to changing your mind about your sin and turning away. Worldly sorrow says it's too late, you've blown it, you might as well give in. You see the difference? So, any time, listen to me, any time you make a mistake and you feel like God can never forgive you, 
that is not of God. That's demonic. And you need to say, no, I am forgiven by Christ Jesus, and I have an opportunity for Christ. Don't allow the enemy to do that. You see, this is what the Apostle Paul talks about. And when they brought, when they brought um, correction to the man in the church, the last part of the verse says this, so that Satan will not outsmart us. How does Satan outsmart us? We're familiar with his evil schemes. Why? To beat someone down so bad they can't get back up. we got to be careful for people that have fallen. There should be responsibility taken for sins. But there should be a road to redemption. Because God has given you a road to redemption as well. You see, the Bible says this. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now that's good news. We have a responsibility to do what? Submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. That's a promise. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Now listen to this. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It says mourn. It talks about there's a series of, of actually mourning your sin and then giving it back to God. God wants you to mourn your sin so you can be cleansed from it, to bleed it out, not to kill you. There's a difference, everybody. You know, they, it's very, very important. Our culture today, um, we don't like to talk about death very much. But in the Old Testament times, they would grieve sometimes up to six months. They would grieve that out to get it out of them. Sometimes you need to grieve your sin so you can be healed of it. Confess it. There was a time that something was controlling me. I didn't know what it was, but Sandra brought it to my attention. What's going on with you and this person? You're always doing something. There seems to be something going on. And I realized there was, a, there was something I did not mourn. And so I, I realized, and I went to that person and said, you know what, I, I have something against you, and I was wrong. Please forgive me. And when I did that, I mourned that sin, and then forgiveness came. But God always wants to restore, not to destroy. Please understand that. And so I love what it says here in Isaiah 54, 17, and it applies to us today. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Listen to this. And every tongue which rises against you. The enemy will rise against you. It's not your thoughts. He'll plant thoughts in your mind or he'll train you. And if you believe lies for a long time, your own mind begins to speak lies, right? And every tongue which rises against you. So anytime you feel condemnation, that's not of God. That's of the enemy. And do not allow his accusations to take you down. You shall condemn. This is the heritage, okay? And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. So in Jesus' name, I reject it. I thank you that I've confessed my sins. He's faithful and just to forgive me of all of my sins. You see, when the devil talks to you about God, he lies. And when the devil talks about you, he talks about you, he accuses you. But this is how we break free. Jesus is your advocate. He is the one that stands to pay the payment for you. See, my little children, this is a John saying, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Okay? But if anyone does sin, which we all do, we have a what? An advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So you're going to sin. Okay? It doesn't mean you have a license to. We're imperfect people. Go to Christ immediately. Don't wait. Don't wait for God to cool down first. He's not your dad or mom. The longer you wait, the easier it is to feel condemned or to get numb towards it. All right? This is what we need to do. You see, Romans 8, 1 and 2 says this. So now there's no what? Condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Okay? There's no common. I hope you understand. If nothing else, please understand me. This, this is very important. The enemy's job is to condemn you. So anytime you feel condemned, it's not God. It's the enemy. Remember this. Godly sorrow brings you back to God, not away from God. So, don't listen to the lies. And also, when we correct each other, we should be gracious to each other as God is to us. I love what it says in 1 John 7 through 9. This is important. But if we are living in the light, I pray that we live in the light. As God is in the light, then we have fellowship with what? Each other. In the Bible, it's always each other. You're not called to live this life alone. We need each other. Not apart from God. 
It's God first, the head, and then the body. Please understand what we're trying to say here. Okay? Head, body. So, but if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And what? The blood of Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So there is a process, everybody. It says in, in the book of James, pray for one another that you may be healed. So there is body life. This is why we encourage you to get involved with small groups. Not because of the small group program. It's because you can have relationship that you can call, that you can be that, that, herd, that pack of zebras that are together watching out that we can kick against the enemy together. Nowhere in the scripture do you see people going by themselves. He sent them out two by two. There's always a community of believers where there's power. Where two or three are gathered. Didn't say, if you're by yourself and me, we can take the world together. Didn't say that. It says, where two or three are gathered in my name. Please understand the importance of being together with other believers, everybody. If you're not doing it, you're at a great disadvantage. In our culture in America, where it's all about rugged individualism, it isn't about that, guys. It's about us and God and us together. His Son cleanses us from all sin. But if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves, everybody. Yes, you have sinned. Yes, you are dirty. Yes, you are worthy of death if not for Jesus Christ, and so am I. All of us. Let's just, let's stop running. I'm worthy and you're worthy of death if not for Jesus Christ. But if we confess, confess means ownership. Before you can give your sin away, you have to own it. I can't give something to you truly. I cannot truly give you something if I don't own it, right? If I take $10 from somebody and then give it to you, that's, I'm not giving you $10 that I have. But if it's my $10 and I give it to you, if I own the $10 and give it to you, then it's, then I really give it away. My friends, it's time to own our sin. There is sin. Sin separates us from God. God loves us. He wants us to do that. Give us, if we confess our sins to Him, the Bible says He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness, just like we saw in Zechariah. God wants to clothe you with priestly garments. He wants to put a turban clean on your head. He wants to make you pure and holy. Let's bow our heads. Father, I want to thank you so much that you love us. Lord, I pray that you, right now, that you would touch every single person here. Father, we recognize that all of us have fallen and have fallen short of your ways. And Lord Jesus, we want to give our lives to you afresh. With every head bowed, let me ask you a question today. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you confessed your sins to Him? Listen, it's not getting your act together. It's getting your surrender together. What He's asking for you to do is to say, I resign from being the boss of my life. I receive forgiveness that Christ has done for me. I turn away from what I know is wrong, and I turn to Christ. If you're willing to do that today, then today can be a new day for you. If you've never given your life to Jesus, that's what he's asking you to do. He's asking you to deny yourself, to give up ownership and give it to him because he loves you, he's made you, you're made in his image. And something in you is wrong until you give it back to God. Something way off. But when you give your life to Christ, what happens is you're rightly aligned with your creator and you become the person God's created you to be. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, Today could be your day. You must be willing to let go of control. Turn away from your sins and trust Him. What He's done for you on the cross. With every head bowed, I'm going to ask you a question today. Maybe you used to walk with God and you walked away. And you realize that today is the day of salvation. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Today's the day. If you want to just, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to pray a prayer in a few moments. And if you'd like me to include you in that prayer, I'm going to ask you to say, Pastor, I want to raise my hand and say, I want to give my life to Christ for the very first time. I want to, re I want to renew my commitment. Anyone this morning who said, that, that's me? Or a couple in the first service. Anyone here today? Say, Pastor, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's be real here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Several, four or five of you this morning. Let's pray. Let's pray this prayer together, okay, in your own heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. 
I repent and I turn away from what I know is wrong. And I invite you to be the center of my life. I, come, I say my life is not my own, it is yours. Fill me now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank God for what he's doing in people's lives right now. We thank you, Father. Amen. In your worship, God, on the, on, the, on the pocket in front of you is a card. And the card, it says this, I'm committing my life to Christ for the first time. I'm regaining the commitment. If you take a few moments to fill that out, what we're going to do now is going to ask the ushers to, tent, to hand off the, uh, the elements to everybody. Right now, we're going to do communion. And the reason why I waited to the end is because this is, I, I would like, if you prayed that prayer today, you are a candidate to, to be with us today and take communion. Communion is a very serious thing, by the way. Because this represents what Christ did for us on the cross. We don't believe this is the body and blood of Christ. But we believe it represents the body and the blood of Christ. And we also believe, not only does it represent that, we believe His presence is here. And so the Bible says that let a man or woman examine himself before they take communion, lest they drink condemnation on themselves. Let me just warn you. If you're not willing to forgive somebody else or yourself, don't take this. We take this seriously. We're not asking you to be perfect. Now, if your emotions still feel unforgiveness, that's okay. You have to make a decision with your will, not your emotions. Say, Father, even though I don't want to forgive this person, I choose to be obedient and I forgive this person. If you're willing to do that, that's all part of it. You know why? Because communion is all about one big thing, forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Christ forgave us. Jesus says, as the Father has given you, so have I forgiven you. Jesus says, if you do not forgive others, the Father will not forgive you. So friends, please listen to me. We take this seriously here. You need to be willing to forgive yourself and other people. It's an act of the will, not the emotions. We have to stop letting our emotions control us. And we have, to, we have to control our emotions with our decisions. And our emotions need to come into alignment. So if you're willing to do that today, I encourage you to do this. Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, so this is my body which has been broken for you. Guys, he was broken that we could be whole. He was broken to bring broken relationships back together. And how does broken relationships get healed? By the blood of Jesus Christ. By forgiving. Remember, everybody, you're not created to hold on forgiveness. Unforgiveness is toxic to your body, to your spirit. Some of you might even be sick and have conditions because you don't forgive. You want to break the curse, forgive. Yeah, but they don't deserve it. Neither do you. Take, eat. This is my body which has been broken for you. After they ate, Jesus took the cup which was the new covenant, new way of doing things. It's by His blood we have healing, we have restoration of mind, of body, of spirit, and relationship. If we could just kind of lift this cup, I'm going to pray, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you bring healing to people's bodies, people's minds, people's relationships. We thank you. It's by your stripes we're made whole. Bless the Lord all my soul who forgives all of our sins and heals all of our diseases. We thank you that the healing is in what you did on the cross. We pray for healing right now in Jesus' name. Healing for skin conditions, healing for emotional situations, healing for bone structure issues, whatever it is, Lord. We just, we just want to receive that healing right now for what you've done. Take it, everyone, drink. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, I thank you right now for today. Lord, we thank you for what you did on the cross. And Lord, we pray right now. We break the power of the enemy right now in our lives. We choose to believe what you say about us. We choose to walk in forgiveness. And Lord Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, remind us that when we fall and make mistakes, we pray, God, that you would give us godly sorrow for our sins that we would have godly sorrow that would bring us to repentance to get right with you. Father, we ask that we would walk clean in this place by allowing you to cleanse us. 
that we would not give the devil the opportunity to be the accuser. For we thank you that you, Jesus, are the one that makes us whole. In Jesus' name. Father, we pray that we would not let the accuser speak to us and we would not accuse each other. We pray we walk in your freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is what we're going to do. We're going to conclude right now with an opportunity to give back to the Lord through our tithes and our offerings. If you fill that card out today, we're going to ask you to put it in the offering basket. If you're a guest here today, do not feel obligated to give. This is for folks that call Cornerstone Church their church. So go ahead, Father, bless this offering in Jesus' name. Go ahead and drop those cards in there. As we're doing that, a couple of points. This is part of the worship service, what we're going to do. After we do this, we're going to have an opportunity to, to stand. We're going to ask our prayer team to come up. We're going to have the band play a little longer if we need to go. That's fine. But if you need prayer for anything at all, if you want someone to pray with you, if you gave your life to Christ for the first time, tell someone up here. Also, as you leave here today, we want to encourage you on the right-hand side, there's an information desk. There they have a Bible, grab one, and there's a book called Fresh Start. Please feel free to take it. That's our gift to you, okay? We want to encourage you to walk in the way that God would have for you. One other announcement I have is that today at 1 o'clock, we have something called Growth Track, step one. You get to find out what Cornerstone Church believes, how you can become a part of it. You don't have to become a member, but you get to hear about it. We have child care and a catered meal. Come out of the hot, get into the nice cold. We'll have a great time together. I'll be teaching. It would be an honor to have you there. We have extra spots. Let's all stand as we talk about the, that Jesus is our freedom. He makes the darkness flee. As we're doing that, we're going to ask our prayer team to come forward to pray with you. If you need anything at all, we want to be able to pray with you. Come, let's worship God together. Let's experience His freedom together. ask the prayer team to make their way down. We'd love to be able to pray with you today. God bless you. All the fronts are open for prayer.